boys out and boys and girls, men and women of all ages and walks of life. So what we're going to do today is something just a little bit different than my usual build videos and what I'm doing with those or my, or my demo videos. We're going to try something a little different. Um, and there's a reason I'm doing this. I'll just kind of come up here and talk to you for a minute. When I was watching the YouTube Great Guitar Build Off, one of the guys that I like uh, watching in general is Dan from Guns and Guitars. And he's one of the judges. Uh, they judge both completely scratch built guitars and they do uh, kick guitars. And so he was going through the criteria of how he judges uh, these uh, competitions. And one of the things he mentioned was he liked videos better that had background music. I've never had background music that I can remember in any of my videos. <clears throat> Maybe that's why nobody was watching my videos. <laughs> Anyways, so I put this on just for the heck, I don't know if you can hear it or not. It is the Brian Swan Band uh, out of Southern Oregon. Uh, Brian's a really crafty songwriter. He's very good, great singer. And uh, I've got the privilege of hopefully doing a gig with him in a couple of weeks. So I'm a little nervous about that. But anyways, uh, look him up on the internet, Brian Swan Band. Uh, it's great music. It's Some of it's quite Steely Danish, and you can't you know, go wrong with Steely Dan. Uh, so anyways, what I'm here to do is kind of show you this guitar and give you just a tiny bit of history on me and insight on how this thing came about. So um, I started as a drummer in uh, junior high and high school. I played in some really good Southern California bands back then. Uh, I was blessed and honored to play with some, like I said, great guys. I also played in a large Christian orchestra uh, that toured all over the West Coast and Canada. Um, so that's what I was doing in those days. And then kind of got out of college or left college, shall we say. And uh, I sold my drums and I moved to Southern Oregon. And I've been here kind of ever since. And you know, so I really didn't have anything. Now I had a guitar laying around. Um, it wasn't a good guitar, just a cheap little thing. And I dinked around on it. And so lo and behold, one day I get a phone call and this guy says, well, I heard you play guitar. I said, well, I don't know if you've got the right number or not, because I'm a really guitar player. He said, well, we need a guitar player. The guitar player we have is leaving at the end of the summer. He's going to back to be a school teacher. But I said, okay. So I went over to his house, and I also didn't have an amplifier at that time. And uh, so I was working at the airport, and this guy at the airport said, well, I got an amplifier for you. And uh, he gave me a, uh, a bare chassis with some tubes on it. And um, uh, I think I had some kind of a funky speaker box that I borrowed or something. But anyways, I took that over to, to do this audition for these guys. And uh, lo and behold, they somewhat, they somehow liked what I was doing. And I, I was, a, at that point in time in my life, I was able to catch on to everything they were doing quite quickly. They were playing some 60s stuff, you know, uh, but basically just kind of whatever was playing on the radio at that point in time. That was 1979. And so, um, by the way, when we turned that amp on for the first time at that guy's house, we all kind of looked at it because a little smoke was there, and we called it the bomb, and lo and behold, the second time we used it, it blew up. <laughs> so anyways, enough about all those things, but that's kind of how I got started playing music <clears throat> up here and playing the guitar professionally. So let me show you this guitar. And by the way, this is now my son's guitar. I've given it to him. And you're saying, what is it doing here? And I'll tell you all about it. So here we go. It kind of looks like a Strat. Kind of. Then you turn it over and, uh-oh. That's a neck through. What's up with that? Well, I'll tell you what's up with that. So... As we got a little better and we started doing a lot of gigs, we did a lot of out-of-town gigs where we'd do an, almost like a house band thing. We'd play at certain clubs for a, a month, sometimes six weeks or something like that. So anyways, uh, as most musicians, they either sleep all day because they party all night long, or like me, I would, for some reason I've always been an early riser, so I'd get up and I'd go around to the music stores just bug the heck out of the people that own the music stores. They probably hated guys like us, because we just went in there and tried out instruments all day long. Oh, look at that amp. We never bought anything. 
unless it was a little twenty dollar battle or something. <clears throat> Anyways, I was in a music store one day up in Roseburg, I think it was, Oregon, and this thing was hanging on the wall. It did not look like this at all. So, um, on the headstock, uh, it has my logo on there, and I just stuck this on there the other day, but it said Austin. And Austin, in those days, in the late 70s, early 80s, I think it was, they were making this little guitar called a hatchet. I've never seen them since then, and I've only seen a few. And it was a neck, and then the it what looked like a, a, a hatchet, you know, a hand hatchet for getting wood. And uh, they were like an early generation of a travel guitar. So, anyways, I bought this because it looked very sad. It was sad, forlorn, hanging on the wall, and obviously it had been there a long time. It was kind of dusty and, you know, just sitting there. Nobody wanted it because it was just an absolutely no-brand guitar. Uh, <clears throat> It was shaped somewhat like this. The headstock was a little different, and the body was completely different. And it was these pieces were clear at that time. Whether they're uh, maple or ash or alder, I really am not sure. All you expert wood guys would know. But at that time, I played it for a while. Bad electronics, they squealed and everything. But I, it, it still worked, and it worked pretty good. It worked better than the other thing I had. So I used that for a little while. And then we started making some money, and uh, I was able to um, upgrade it a bit, shall we say. So at that point in time, I bought, I made a black pick guard for it. I took all the, the junk out that was in there, and I put a Bill Lawrence 500 and a Bill Lawrence XL 500 in the bridge position. One knob, a coil splitter, and a three-way switch. I did not do the wiring, and then I just had a guy do it. <clears throat> So I played it like that for a while, and I'll tell you what, I tortured this guitar, and, and it saw the elements. I mean, we just had an open bed pickup truck for a long time before we got bands. But, you know, uh, it saw a lot of bad weather. It saw super high heat, and it saw super colds, and it lasted through all of them. So that's kind of where this thing came from, and I want to show you something else about this. You can see that when I was working at a sign shop, Long, after I'd had this for many years, uh, there was a big belt sander there, a big industrial belt sander with like a one grit paper on it. I just took it to this neck because my hands are skinny. So you can see how thin this thing is this way. It's quite large this way, fat across, but this way it's skinny. And I also did this up in here. So anyways, during my travels, I had met a guy named John Taggart, who was also in a, uh, a band in the area. He was a fabulous luthier uh, and guitar maker. He made beautiful, beautiful instruments uh, for some pretty prominent people. And uh, so he was uh, had all these great, great, great equipment. I took it over there one day. I said, you know, let's cut this sucker up. Let's make it mine. He said, let's get to it. So we cut it way smaller probably three eighths of an inch all the way around and and like you can see here the horns are totally different they're much more scooped out more pointy they're very pointy so anyways it looks it, in some ways looking at the horns it resembles a gem 777 you know and uh so that's where that sat for a while i kept playing it until i uh, commissioned a custom built guitar and that's where uh, Steve Spalding came in. So I, after John and I had cut this up and reshaped it, I uh, had a little time off, so I took it home and I stained it. And these clear wood wings became this dark color. And um, then I linseed oiled it. And I must have, I did about 10 coats of linseed oil on it. It was really hot at that point in time. And I just linseed oil it, hang it up, bring it in the next day, steel wood, linseed oil, hang it up. And I gotta tell you, this, this guitar is still, it's not dry wood. It still really feels really great and it's not dried out and, you know, brittle and cracky or anything. It's that linseed oil really did a job on this thing. So, <clears throat> anyways, uh, it went along for a while like that. And a friend of mine that uh, actually was the guitar player in the band I was in when I was in high school, uh, he started, he worked at Fender and he became pretty well known down there. And, he was in with the NAMM shows and a lot of that kind of stuff. And he got parts and stuff a lot from companies, you know, to try out and test out and to demo and things. 
and uh, he was also living with Jackson Guitars at the time, and he had just, I went to his house one time, he must have had 10 or 15 of them that, at that point in time, I was actually working a musician's friend, and they started selling Jackson Guitars, but only custom built. You couldn't buy one off the shelf. Everything was custom ordered. The necks, the pickups, the paint, everything. And so Henry would get all the rejects or once people put a down payment on and then buy them or they got a dent or whatever. So he had all this stuff laying around. And he had these two prototype Godo bridges. Uh, this is one of them. Uh, the other one is identical, but on the back, it had some kind of a strange locking mechanism that locked the, the, the uh, strings down. And I didn't need that one. And he didn't care, so he sold me this one or whatever. So I, um, at this point in time, I took it to Steve Spalding. <clears throat> and uh, Steve really fixed this thing up for me. Uh, he made it a true professional instrument, even though I'd used it for a long time. Uh, he just, he did, he did the beautiful, uh, uh, all the routing. Uh, he, he installed the, uh, the eighties dead giveaway, you know, fat head. He put on the Spurzel, uh, staggered hide, uh, locking tuners, the graphite nut, of course, did all the routing, put this puppy in here. And yes, many, many people can route. Many, many people can build guitars, but Steve Spalding, in my opinion, which is called Spalding Guitar Technologies, I believe now, uh, you cannot, he's just fabulous. Uh, he's meticulous, and he's uh, he's worked on guitars by many, many famous, famous people, and he's just really good at it. So if you need your guitar done, but you're not in a hurry, <laughs> give him a call in Ashland, Oregon. <laughs> Spalding Guitar Neck Technologies. <laughs> Anyways, thank you, Steve. He was like my go-to guy for almost every instrument I've ever owned. Uh, up until just a little while back because he's so busy he's months and months out on doing work with people so anyways I thought what I would do today and so when I decided to give this to my son uh, kind of as a you know a family heirloom kind of thing I thought you know he has an ESP which is really nice it's a nice big thick sounded you know metal hard rock guitar it's, you know, can play anything but that's what it's really good at and that's what he likes playing so I thought, you know what, I'll give him something a little bit different. So what I did is I went and I built a new pick guard for it. I did this. I put in three DiMarzio, I believe they're fast tracks. And I put three regular switches. And you know, uh, gone was the single switch or uh, volume control. And so it's set up just like a strap. And I got to give kudos to somebody else again, Leonard Griffey. Uh, and if you've never heard of Leonard Griffey, you need to look him up. If you like blues music, you need to look him up on the interwebs or on a website. I don't know if he's on YouTube. He might be. And it might be like Griff Blues or Leonard Griffey Blues. The guy's just phenomenal. And he's not just phenomenal. He's just an incredibly cool guy. I had the privilege and honor to play with him for a number of years in a couple of different bands. Uh, and, you know, he helped me rewire this thing. Uh, it, it took us a while, but we got it all rewired. And I just thank you, Leonard, because... Uh, Without him doing that, I wouldn't have got it over to my son. So anyways, let's put this thing and turn it on here. And we'll do a, uh, just a couple of quick little sound demos. Oops, sorry, Brian, i got to turn you off for a minute. <laughs> so what, let's start with the middle pickup on this. I don't know why, but let's start with the middle. And um, we'll just play a few little um, ditties on each position. You can see that it does sound like a strap. And this is how it ended up, just like this, and I hope it stays like this. One other thing is that one thing Steve did for me on every guitar I bought or he built for me, I put bass frets in it. I love bass frets. I don't know why, I just do. Some people think they're ridiculous or they, they go out of tune or you got to press too hard other than skinny little frets, but I love these things. So let's just make a few notes here. <laughs> Let's go to the uh, number four position, which are these two, of course. And this, of 
course, is Robert Cray's favorite rhythm tone of all time. I, I'm sure he uses other sounds, but, you know, he's known for this exact tone, and it's my second favorite on a Strat, and it's that what some people refer to as a quack tone or a bell tone, but it's the darker of the two. And, uh, you know, it's kind of funny because when I was first starting to play and play and starting to play a lot, we were playing some of the same clubs as Robert Cray. And so I got to see him a number of times for a couple of dollars, you know, before he was regionalist, regionally famous and, and popular, but he had not become the superstar he turned into just a few years later. So anyways, let's do this number uh, two position here, this number four. <laughs> Uh, it's also good for lead playing, but uh, <clears throat> that's that tone. And let's go to the old Stevie Ray Vaughan standby that he used on that great song of the 80s. Um, <clears throat> and uh, Stevie Ray used them all, but he liked this front pickup a lot. And you get a good front pickup in a Strat, and they sound pretty darn cool. So let's just do, do a little demo of uh, that really great song he did years ago. <laughs> That was the old Stevie Ray tone, and of course the middle pick, that front pickup. So these back two are my favorite tone, the quack tone, whatever you want to call it. Uh, I think an awful lot of Strat players just love this tone, and uh, it is absolutely my favorite. I wish I could kind of have this one tone on every guitar I own. You know, I have a couple of different kinds. Some of them are just double pickups, Paul Reed Smith or whatever, and uh, you don't get that tone with them. Sometimes you can get a kind of really cool telly tone with them but you can't get the old quackaroo so let's you know and it also has a great lead tone how many times have you seen eric or any of those guys like that that are playing uh lead guitar and they there you can see it it's right there on that one and it sounds pretty good overdriven i think how we do that and of course then the bridge pickup it's funny because frank zappa once coined the phrase which he may not have made up but he made it known to the public called the ice pick and the forehead sound and a few guys had it roy buchanan had it for days that guy was mr ice pick plus johnny guitar wasson and now the johnny guitar was playing a 335 but you know probably if you looked at his amp settings there was no middle no bass all treble and it was probably the back pickup. But here's the old uh, ice pick on the forehead. <laughs> Sounds pretty cool too. So there you have that. So I'm wondering if I had to do a short demo with this. I don't know. Maybe I'll just turn something on for a minute. 
because uh, so far my technology is not, I'm not, I don't know how to edit yet, or I don't, I just haven't figured that out. I don't have any of this other stuff going on, so we're still just kind of playing it by ear. Let's just turn this little loop I made on uh, just for a little bit, and I'll play a little bit, and we'll see how this sounds in a format with that. I don't know why I picked this one, it just happened to be there. Demo. This thing still works really good. It sounds great. I'm so happy and thrilled that my son has it. And like I said, I just brought it back over here because it had been sitting for a long time. Just needed cleaned up and, uh, or, you know, restrung. And I had to kind of go through the electronics and clean them up and all that kind of good stuff. And I'm pretty happy with it now. <clears throat> I even uh, went ahead and I don't know if you can see it or not because it's dark against dark, but I put one of my little logos on there. Eh. But, you know, even though I didn't produce this guitar, I still remade it. Anyways, guys, uh, in the long run, I'm hoping that this gives you a little more insight to why I do the things I do. You know, I grew up in that era where you just, I'm just one of those guys that likes to take things apart and fix them up. And I'm not talking about mowing the lawn or doing the plumbing. You know, I'm just talking about hobby stuff, model cars, cars, motorcycles. Anyways, uh, you guys have a great and wonderful day. We're back to having a mess. We're back to having more COVID problems uh, up here in the Pacific Northwest and California. Um, fires everywhere. It's been hotter than blazes for days and days and days in a row. I mean, 100 plus and horrible smoke. You know, don't go outside kind of smoke. Anyways, let's just keep our spirits up. Let's say our prayers. Let's get through this together. I love you guys all. Please like my channel subscribe to it if you feel so moved and please leave comments because i don't know what i should do better unless you tell me and you help me out maybe i'll take your suggestions maybe i won't but still i need to know what the public thinks and if they like it anyways i hope you guys are having a blessed day a great day and i will see you later next time bye bye